Bonjour à tous. <laughs> Good morning, and I'm very sorry um, uh, to uh, speak in English rather than in French. I don't want to uh, make you suffer with my attempts to uh, speak uh, French. Uh, but I would like to say that I'm happy to être ici. Uh, I'm very honored and very happy to be here with you uh, today. Um, not so much for this presentation, but for this conversation um, uh, with the lessons that we learned um, uh, in the critical complex times we've lived and what we could uh, perhaps accomplish uh, together. So this is my um, my invitation uh, for the reflection I'm going to do with you today. Can people at the uh, online hear me well and see me well from where I'm standing? Perfect. Okay, good. So when uh, uh, Craig O'Heap uh, invited me to come and talk to you, I was thinking about a topic in which we could discuss. And uh, approaching the end of the year, uh, the beginning of a new year, and in case of uh, Isla, of new possibilities, um, um, for next year with um, the coming elections uh, of Isla. I think it is a time for us to stop and think about the lessons we've, we've learned about the possibilities uh, we can have, not only as applied linguists, but as people to engage uh, together. So this is the provocation, invitation and reflection that I am uh, um, hoping to be able to uh, achieve with you today. Um, uh, uh, to start, I just would like to say that part of um, this uh, talk and this uh, reflection is, of course, um, uh, infused or inspired uh, not only in the current work I'm doing as, a, uh, as an applied linguist, uh, but also uh, on the uh, geopolitical uh, situation, I would say, of the, the world today and the the crisis that we have experienced ever since uh, the pandemic, starting with the pandemic and then with other uh, world crises. Um, and uh, as I said, the objective would be to reflect about um, the critical complex times we are living uh, and try to think about our roles um, as applied linguists, as people, um, as citizens uh, in, this, uh, in this new uh, reality. Uh, with that uh, reflection, I would like to invite everyone present and also uh, online, uh, whether you are applied linguists uh, or not, uh, to uh, reflect about uh, issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging, peace building, uh, and uh, perhaps with the examples that I'm going to show you today, focus on how we can um, re uh, perhaps change the unequal uh, uh, relations of power that are immersed and manifested uh, in language ideologies, language practices, in diverse uh, contexts, educational uh, settings, uh, and uh, different places and uh, uh, countries. And uh, to do that, uh, I'm going to use, for part of it, uh, I'm going to use um, decolonial lens that, uh, as I was uh, uh, mentioning to Gregory uh, during dinner uh, last night, in Latin America, um, we understand uh, decolonial lens not to be so much linked to colonial ties or colonial views, but to this uh, delinking from um, um, oppression uh, 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 relations um, among um, uh, citizens. And so we are going to use this uh, decolonial lens to question, to identify and to interrogate, uh, interrupt or question the, in this case, uh, and as a linguist, the hegemony of English in education, science, technology, society, uh, and also in academic knowledge uh, production, trying to highlight the increased focus on language diversity, problematizing notions of multilingualism, in relation to linguistic rights, ecology of languages, and possible knowledges produced uh, in those uh, languages. And because of the role of um, technology, especially artificial intelligence nowadays, and its interplay and um, interrelations with the, the production of knowledge and in different languages, also perhaps reflect a little bit about the context in which uh, we are living of algorithm this is a difficult word for me to pronounce in Portuguese or in uh, English, Algor Algor algorithmatized uh, life, which is what we are uh, living with uh, artificial intelligence. And so um, if I achieve this uh, aim and this uh, invitation that I'm 
making for you today. The idea would be for us to discuss how we, either, whether as researchers, applied linguists, uh, citizens, language educators, you name it, can um, uh, perhaps promote more uh, critical, informed, plural, culturally rich environments for knowledge production, sharing, uh, teaching, uh, etc. And um, another acknowledgement that I must make uh, at this point is that um, part of this work, and of course my um, research and uh, action with uh, Isla, um, is inspired. And uh, part of what I'm, uh, the references and the work that I'm going to share with you today is inspired in this uh, new Isla Ren. Uh, Ren is a research network uh, from Isla. Um, this is uh, the one I'm mentioning uh, is the English as a medium of education, multilingualism and the uh, SDGs, so sustainable development goals in terms of equity, diversity and inclusion. So basically looking at how language in face of English and other um, um, uh, roles uh, can um, impact or can uh, actually promote more equity, diversity and inclusion uh, in the world. This uh, REN, in turn, draws on uh, Isla's endorsed uh, principles of uh, good practices and ethics in applied linguistics, the uh, UN um, Agenda uh, 2030 for Sustainable um, uh, and Development uh, Goals, and also Open Science, and also the Ibero-American Association of Applied Linguistics, IALA, which, unlike other uh, regional associations from ILA, such as the European Association of Applied Linguistics or the Southeast Asian and the Asian uh, Associ Association of Applied Linguistics, is not so much a regional association, though the name is the regional Ibero-America. This is the first regional um, association from uh, ILA, which is actually um, uh, focused on linguistic rather than geographical ties. So the aim is to promote other languages in the Ibero-American um, uh, 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 region and beyond. So mostly Spanish, uh, Portuguese, and uh, other languages besides uh, English. Um, uh, in a way, trying to make, um, uh, trying to balance more uh, the production sharing of knowledge uh, in, in other languages and through the uh, work of Isla. And so, um, without further ado, we start this uh, reflection, um, thinking of the role of um, uh, technology in how we came to, to the context in which uh, we are living today with uh, not only um, after the pandemic with the uh, role of um, uh, information and communication technologies, uh, but also um, uh, after last year, for example, with what uh, artificial intelligence has meant uh, to us. And uh, it is interesting when we think about uh, technology in terms of human evolution to think that some people would think that, uh, for example, technology is just an instrument. And of course, it is not either good or bad. It depends on how we, we use technology. But it would be important, I think, for us to reflect on how technology constitutes us as much, so much that, for example, I, I'm speaking to you right now and I can read my slides, not only with the support of uh, technology, of course, but with these glasses, that it's a piece of technology. I would not be the same Kidia without the glasses for sure. Just like some people would not be the same without pacemaker, chip implants, and so, we are living uh, a reality and a context in which different um, pieces of technology constitute not only who we are and what we can do, uh, but also how we relate uh, and express uh, in, in the world. And with the advent of um, artificial intelligence uh, on one, uh, one hand, and also the algorithmization uh, of life, um, I think it is important for us to pause and reflect about where we're going and how we are affected and uh, perhaps deceived by these uh, uh, technologies. So this is one of the aims and the invitation uh, that I make uh, for you today. Um, I also brought these uh, images uh, because I feel that um, with the current and most recent advancements in technology, the boundaries uh, boundaries between what is human, what is machine is perhaps becoming a lot fuzzier. It is very difficult for us to, uh, for example, to say, to draw a line, where does one start, where does one end? Uh, let's think about artificial intelligence for one uh, thing. 
part of our artificial intelligence is based on natural languages and the input and corpus uh, are created with uh, languages. So can we say that it's only machine or that it's only human because there are so many um, uh, interactions and uh, cross boundaries uh, between those two. Um, and uh, the reason why I brought this Troy horse um, uh, image here is because this is um, one of the provocations, one of the claims that I would like to uh, reflect with you today, whether, um, as I said, technology is not uh, uh, either good or bad, it depends on how we use it and what we use it for, but whether uh, we are perhaps using uh, technology as a Troy horse um, in some aspects. And uh, one of them that I will um, like to focus with you today and to give you some examples is uh, with uh, language. Ever since artificial intelligence brought many advantages and many benefits um, um, to society uh, and also to multilingualism uh, in the possible translations uh, with artificial uh, intelligence, for example, it also reduced um, uh, investments in language teaching and uh, possibilities and even motivations for people to learn uh, more languages. To give you one uh, practical example um, from uh, Brazil, I've been trying to uh, emphasize uh, different uh, researchers uh, in Brazil about the need to publish um, and to produce uh, knowledge um, uh, and academic knowledge articles in different languages. Because if we produce and publish only in, in English, of course, we're going to uh, interact and, and have this global conversation with uh, international partners. But what happens to the uh, local communities that perhaps can, be be can and should be benefited by the knowledge that is produced and that will not have access, access to this knowledge? And so um, I say that uh, usually researchers producing, uh, producing and speaking other languages apart from English um, we have this different dilemma between having international conversations, international visibility at the expense of uh, losing relevance uh, locally, or uh, to produce uh, knowledge uh, which is uh, relevant locally at the expense of uh, having um, a global visibility. As um, I, I think a dilemma that most um, English-speaking um, uh, researchers, uh, for example, do not have to face this uh, trade-off between uh, choosing to have global uh, visibility or local uh, relevance. And so I've been uh, traveling around Brazil and trying to talk to researchers in different fields and in different areas, trying to show them uh, the importance of uh, producing knowledge in uh, languages that are accessible um, for the uh, context and the populations, the communities in which they want to uh, affect with this knowledge. And interestingly enough, uh, the hard sciences, the STEM areas, uh, physics, uh, uh, technology, mathematics, for example, uh, they're the ones that hardly ever uh, uh, produce, at least in Brazil, any um, publications in Portuguese. Most of them, they just read and publish um, in English. So talking to some of my colleagues with the physics uh, department, um, and trying to uh, uh, discuss with them the possibilities of uh, uh, publishing, producing knowledge in other languages. They say, well, here comes Kedia, you know, with her claim of, oh, uh, uh, writing and, and publishing in other languages. Kedia, you can stop this because now we don't have this dilemma anymore. Before, they would use the investment that Brazilian uh, financing agencies do on uh, research to translate papers so that they could uh, uh, produce and uh, publish uh, in English. And they said, well, you know, now this problem is solved for us. We don't have to spend any more money uh, anymore because what we do is we just use artificial intelligence. And then I asked them, okay, so you're using artificial intelligence to translate the papers. No, no, it's much more better. I mean, it's much better than this. It's not even translating uh, the papers. What they do is they simply insert their hard data in the Google um, um, chat GPT, for example, and they say, well, right a paper in English with the data. It's as simple as that. With the consequence that those researchers, a few ones that were still trying to translate or learn or even review the uh, translations uh, in English and in other languages, they stopped, you know, investing, wanting to learn other languages because, you know, it takes a long time, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, investment. And uh, so the result uh, of artificial intelligence, of course, is good 
you know, many uh, possibilities for translation, but also the impact on uh, multilingualism, language uh, courses uh, and um, uh, teaching has been also significant. And I think uh, we have to consider this an example of a Troy horse with uh, the use of uh, technology. So as I was saying, there's a boundary between what is physical, what is digital, you know, what is reality, what is uh, virtuality. I think it has become uh, very fuzzy, especially after what we lived with the pandemic, um, where after those two years uh, online, could we say or can we say that our reality uh, online was not reality, that our identities were not uh, um, the same because we were in the uh, online mode. And um, for me, um, when I think of, I know that nobody wants to talk about the pandemic and, you know, about the, the hard and the difficult uh, moments that we lived, but I think that if we don't reflect about and if we don't learn uh, the lessons um, of what happened, um, then it is the result is only the loss and the pain and the the deaths and you know the wars that continue um, um, to happen uh, after that because we haven't learned how to uh, live and express and collaborate uh, differently uh, in the world and just like um, I think the the pandemic is one example of something that started locally but became a global problem. And again, the not only a local problem became a global problem, but also the solution, uh, which uh, was a global uh, cooperation for the vaccine, for example, was uh, um, uh, enacted very differently locally, depending uh, on uh, the country adopting the solution. So this is an example of how we could collaborate and if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have had the vaccine in such a short uh, time. Uh, we only managed to do that because people and researchers in different countries were collaborating so as to find the solution. And so we can see how these global, local uh, interactions, problems and, and solutions are very dependent on how we act and uh, uh, live uh, with each other. So this is... Uh, uh, my um, motivation to uh, reflect with you about how we can perhaps uh, learn a few things or reflect about a few things um, uh, after what happened so as to make things better for the future. Um, again, and now turning back to our roles as uh, teachers, uh, 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 applied linguists who are maybe working with the teaching uh, uh, of other languages, it is important for us to think about the impact and how technology has affected the methodologies and the pedagogies uh, that we learned. And again, to give you one local situated example from my experience in Brazil, I had been um, as a researcher trying to look at the integration and incorporation of technology in different approaches and methodologies for language teaching uh, in Brazil. But I was completely prohibited up until uh, the pandemic to use anything online uh, in my classes. So, for example, blended learning, hybrid approaches, all of that was completely prohibited. And then the pandemic came. Uh, overnight, we were asked to <laughs> sort of integrate and go online. And many of us uh, didn't have the preparation, many of us uh, teachers, uh, I mean, we didn't have the preparation. So what most people did was simply try to transplant what they were doing in person for the online mode many uh, times without um, uh, any critical uh, uh, possibilities of adaptation because we didn't have time, we didn't have, in some cases, uh, uh, support. And after two years doing this, this uh, integration, one day uh, I receive an email from my institution, 5 o'clock p.m. As of tomorrow, uh, we are back to in-person classes. So everything online uh, is prohibited uh, again. And why am I saying this? In the case of my uh, institution, for example, the possibilities we had during those two, two years to experience, to integrate, to learn how to do things uh, differently, to enable and amplify perhaps access, not only to technologies, but to education and to language uh, learning, for example, it was simply discarded overnight. And once we came back to in-person classes, nobody want, wanted to talk about, uh, I mean, it was, it was actually prohibited. We couldn't do anything online uh, anymore. And so um, 
my uh, feeling um, is that in the case of my institution, for example, we have a, um, a proverb, a saying in Portuguese, um, sometimes we are uh, washing, uh, ba uh, giving a bath to the baby, and we throw away the baby together with the water from the... So the feeling I have in Brazil is that, and in my institution at least, is that after the pandemic, people had this feeling that they didn't want to talk about what happened anymore. In fact, when I was trying to talk to um, um, institutional stakeholders about the possibilities of learning or doing things a little bit different after the pandemic, they uh, came to me and they said, Kida, please don't even mention anything online. We have this hangover from uh, online. People are, even the word online um, arises uh, feelings of um, uh, 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 remembering things, that, uh, things they didn't want to uh, think about. And so in my case, I think it's a pity that after uh, all the the pain, all the, the uh, loss and all the difficult moments we live to learn the lessons, we were not able to integrate some of these lessons uh, in our methodologies, pedagogies. And this is why today uh, I'm trying to reflect with you not only about the lessons of the pandemic, but the lessons of the world we live today uh, with wars uh, going on, with uh, um, um, and I think uh, an, uh, um, an increase again in um, monolingual views, uh, in um, uh, the closing uh, of borders, and not only physical borders, but mind uh, uh, borders between uh, individuals, that I think it's important for us to stop and pause, which is my uh, aim with you today. In case of, um, in the specific case of language learning, for example, if we think about the role of uh, technologies uh, in language learning, as I mentioned, not only in translation, uh, but also in foreign uh, language learning, we had, of course, before uh, pandemic apps and um, different um, uh, tools to uh, teach and learn languages. Duolingo, for example, is um, one case. Uh, um, I don't know uh, if uh, some of you have heard or used uh, Duolingo, which uh, enables people to learn uh, 19 different languages. But uh, what people don't probably don't know is that um, Duolingo, for example, is a free uh, app because um, the uh, what is behind or financing uh, Duolingo is actually people who are using it to make the translations. It's based on translating sentences from one language uh, uh, to the other. And uh, the translations that are made in the app is increasing or building the corpus, which is going to be used for, uh, for example, artificial intelligence to uh, translate and to, which is totally okay. I'm not saying that this is uh, bad. What I'm saying is that, um, there are um, uh, apps that uh, enable us to do certain things, such as learning grammar and vocab, uh, not necessarily language learning, because we all know that language learning is a lot more than simply learning grammar rules and, and vocabulary. And uh, nowadays, uh, there are different um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools and sites uh, paid, uh, like Khan Academy, Khan Amigo, uh, for example, that work as a tutor and aim in a way, although they say that they don't, to substitute the teacher so that uh, students can learn by themselves at home with the support of this uh, artificial intelligence teacher or tutor. So these are things and this is a moment, I think, that we teachers, researchers and citizens have to stop and think about where are we going and how we want to, to do things in the future. And so to do this, and as I promised, um, I decided to bring the text that I'm sure some of you uh, uh, know or have come across before, The Paradox of Our Time, which has been widely circulated and I would say inaccurately credited to numerous authors over the years. Um, so as to provide uh, inspiration and perhaps an opportunity for us to reflect and to uh, talk a little bit more uh, in the end of the presentation when we start the questions and answers and, and comments. So um, the, the text goes, the paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings, but shorter tempers, wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, we have less. We buy more, but we enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. 
More degrees, but less sense or common sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, yet more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry, stay up too late, get up too tired, read too little, watch too much TV, and pray too seldom. We've multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but we've entered the uh, depths of the ocean and back, or not, but have trouble crossing the street to meet a neighbor. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not necessarily better things. We've cleaned up the air to an extent, uh, but polluted the soul. We've conquered the atom, but not our prejudice. We write more and learn less. We plan more, but accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. We built more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but we communicate less and less. And these are the times of fast foods and slow digestion, big men and women, but with small characters, steep profits and shallow relationships, and virtual friends that are not really friends. These are the days of two incomes, but more divorce, fancier houses, but broken homes. And also the days of quick trips, disposable diapers, throwaway moral morality, one night stands, overweight bodies, pills that do everything from cheer to quiet to kill. It is a time when there's much in the show window and nothing in the stock room. A time when technology can bring this letter to you and a time when you can choose either to share or uh, to share the insight or just delete. This is the actual uh, message uh, of the paradox uh, of our time. And so based on this, um, I propose that we uh, think about uh, what is the role of applied linguists in the paradox, in the context in which uh, we are living. And so as to perhaps uh, trigger or start this um, uh, what I would like to be a conversation. I offer some thoughts or uh, takeaways um, if you want or an invitation to join me in the in the work that I'm going to uh, share with you today depending on how you take or approach uh, some of these uh, references or examples of how we can do this um, uh, in the future. And this is what I've been thinking and trying to do uh, with my work as a, uh, an applied linguist and also as a citizen, as a person. So I've been trying to think of ways in which we can have more, more cooperation, less competition in our relations, um, uh, and not only in our personal rela relations, but also in the academia and also in our work relations, how we can have more understanding and less prejudice more diversity, multilingualism, less monolingual views. And by monolingual views, I don't mean um, uh, people uh, or uh, only one language. I mean the monolingual views that only one, um, one culture, one language, one form, one idea um, is um, okay. Also, to try to have more com cosmovision to uh, replace exacerbated nationalism or uh, localism. Um, and with this, uh, hoping to promote more ecology of knowledges, languages, and beings, not only human beings, but beings uh, in general, for a more peaceful coexistence uh, with more intercultural communication. And um, my strategy, or the way I've been trying to achieve these goals uh, um, in my work and my invitation to you, is to try to interrogate, identify, interrogate, and interrupt 
in my work and in my life and in my context, practices that go against uh, one to six. So against uh, uh, cooperation, understanding, diversity, uh, cosmovision, ecology of knowledge and a more peaceful uh, coexistence. So to, I selected some of um, some of the recent uh, works that we've done either in my research network or in my research group to just to showcase uh, um, examples. I don't know how we're doing in terms of time. Um, okay like 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, this is more than enough. And um, uh, these um, um, references and these works that I'm going to uh, uh, share with you today, uh, these are just selected ones um, that we can uh, perhaps uh, uh, approach. But um, I, as I mentioned to uh, Gregory, in the end, I'm going to give you the link to the site where you can find all the references, open access, and um, not only these, but uh, a lot more if you want to access and um, perhaps continue this debate and this work. Um, this um, first reference um, that I'm showing you here is um, um, a text discussing the paradigm shift after the pandemic uh, with the virtual uh, exchange. Uh, so the shift from competition, mobility, exclusivity to cooperation, virtual, virtuality and inclusion. To give you one example, um, in um, rich, developed countries, uh, I, I think um, in France, this number would be more or less uh, the same. In Europe, uh, the number of um, uh, students who can engage in academic mobility um, is less than 5%. Um, average is 2% of uh, students who can engage in this kind of uh, activities. In uh, Latin America, this number is less than uh, 1%. In my institution at UFIS, for example, uh, less than 1%, 0 0.98% of the students only can engage uh, in physical academic mobility. But up until before the pandemic, academic mobility was viewed or uh, understood as being uh, an equivalent or a synonym to internationalization. So a lot of uh, uh, institutions, they are uh, ranked and evaluated in terms of number of international students they receive and number of students they can actually um, send uh, abroad. And this, in a way, is a very exclusive uh, activity because uh, it benefits in the best scenarios 2% uh, of uh, the academic community. So 98% uh, are out. With the, the uh, pandemic and the measures of social distances, a lot of institutions uh, although uh, uh, researchers working with the internationalization of higher education had been claiming and uh, um, asking for more uh, virtual uh, exchanges to replace, not only to replace, but to give more opportunities for other students that were not able to engage in physical mobility. It was not, it was only after the pandemic when uh, academic mobility was forcibly uh, stopped because of the social distancing measures that uh, some institutions started um, um, thinking and in incorporating uh, virtual exchange, for example, in uh, different uh, courses uh, so as to internationalize the curriculum and to have a more internationalization at home approach which was more inclusive and more uh, possible for most uh, uh, students, researchers, uh, professors and staff uh, to engage. So this um, study uh, here, for example, it shows how this has, uh, uh, it has represented not only a paradigm shift for students and uh, uh, teachers and professors who were able to engage in these um, uh, approaches after the pandemic, but most importantly for the Global South, uh, because uh, countries in the Global South, they were limited to sending um, uh, students and academics. Hardly ever we, we, we send more uh, students than we are able to receive. And um, with this change to virtual exchange, for example, we were able to open up the array of uh, collaborations that we have and to have more collaborations in different languages with different partners and uh, with different courses and uh, students. So it has um, represented, uh, I think, uh, a good uh, way of internationalizing, internationalizing at home and the curriculum after the pandemic. These two other um, studies that I mentioned, the first one, uh, Fernando France and Guimarães, um, uh, made um, a bibliographic, bibliometric uh, survey uh, and assessment 
of all the papers published in the Ibero-America region, uh, looking at uh, uh, numbers of papers published in Spanish, Portuguese, uh, and uh, English, to see whether there was uh, a possibility for an ecology of knowledges produced uh, in, in those languages. And of course, uh, results show that no, uh, the, the tendency is for the increase of English uh, um, uh, in those uh, areas. So in the last decade, um, uh, even researchers in different uh, areas, uh, and, and in particular in Latin America, they have uh, reduced the number of papers they write in Portuguese and Spanish and increased the number of papers they write uh, in English with the implications, as I mentioned in the beginning, that local communities that depend on those uh, knowledges and they cannot access those knowledges uh, in English will not be benefited by the, that research. So, uh, in a way, to uh, sort of try to address uh, these, um, the implications of the use and hegemony of uh, English um, for the production of knowledge, in the second uh, paper um, for Global English, neither a hydra or a Tyrannosaurus rex or red herring, but ecology of approaches, I propose that we applied linguists work together uh, with other approaches from uh, political economy, uh, uh, etc., so as to promote more uh, social uh, social justice with the, the languages and the work uh, that we do. Um, this is uh, another um, study that we made looking at the languages and also uh, citations and references uh, in uh, Spanish, Portuguese uh, and English. To give you one uh, example of this, um, Brazil, depending on the year that we analyze this, is either the 11th or the 12th or the 13th, as I said, depending on the year, largest uh, producer of academic knowledge in the world. So we produce uh, the 11th, 12th, or 13th uh, largest academic production in the world. And um, uh, th despite this uh, represent uh, big representation in numbers, in actual numbers, um, the visibility of uh, uh, Brazilian research is uh, very limited. Less than 1% of our uh, papers are indexed in international uh, databases. And this, of course, is not only because of the language, there are all other questions involved, but of course, language is a big um, language and the geopolitical um, um, position uh, of uh, researchers is, of course, um, um, I, I think something that has to be addressed or uh, looked at. Uh, other ideas in this uh, paper, for example, we look at how uh, COIL, virtual exchange, or uh, this kind of um, um, exchanges between uh, countries can um, work as a third space where we have not resolution, but contradictions and uh, multiple uh, voices, so as to, um, uh, I think, uh, promote more diversity uh, also online. One of the criticisms and one of my concerns in terms of the algor algorithmization of life is that what happens is that, um, I, and I don't know whether um, uh, you know that, but um, algorithms make us live in a bubble where we tend to interact and have this um, feeling that we are um, uh, part of a, a common universal discourse, which is not. So more and more and more, we are uh, living in this bubble without opportunities to see uh, different views, different voices, different uh, opinions. And so um, I believe that perhaps we can use technology to do the opposite, to increase diversity, increase uh, cacophony, to increase uh, number of voices uh, and also languages, of course. So this is one example. Um, and this is um, another recent example of how we were trying to do this in a different way with a more multilingual mindset. This is a publication with Ripledge, uh, for example, um, that has attempted to do it in different languages. So using Portuguese, English and um, uh, Spanish. So as to try to, uh, in a way, decolonize Latin American research uh, in uh, 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 applied linguistic research in Latin America. And this is the last one I'm going to show you. I'm not going to go through the uh, abstract. This is just um, a proposal that has been um, accepted for a special issue for the uh, ILA Review uh, Journal. Um, by the way, uh, I'm not sure whether you know that, but AFLA as part of ILA and uh, uh, um, 
any of the researchers uh, within uh, ILA and uh, AFLA can propose special issues for um, ILA review. This is one that has been um, accepted to be published in 2025. And so these are some of the um, efforts that I wanted to uh, show you uh, today um, to perhaps um, invite you to uh, work with us towards more uh, uh, multilingualism, more diversity, more inclusion, more equity. And I finish with this image. This is, uh, these are two of the images, day and night, of Vitoria, the, my permanent address in the state of Espírito Santo in Brazil, the beautiful bridges of Vitoria. And I'd like to finish in this tone with an appeal and an invitation for us as citizens, as people, and as applied linguists to uh, build more bridges uh, and less walls and less uh, wars. And I thank you very much for your patience um, uh, and uh, opportunity to reflect with you. As I said, all of the uh, references uh, and the, the, the works that I mentioned today are uh, open access in the, in the site. You can access not only them, but all the other projects and, and uh, possibilities. And I, I don't know if I am okay with the time. So thank you very much.